War and Peace, Book Six, Chapter Nineteen, read for LibriVox.org by Wet Coast. Next day, Prince Andrew called at a few houses he had not visited before, and among them at the Rostovs, with whom he had renewed acquaintance at the ball. Apart from considerations of politeness which demanded the call, he wanted to see that original eager girl who had left such a pleasant impression on his mind in her own home. Natasha was one of the first to meet him. She was wearing a dark blue house-dress, in which Prince Andrew thought her even prettier than in her ball-dress. She and all the Rostov family welcomed him as an old friend, simply and cordially. The whole family, whom he had formerly judged severely, now seemed to him to consist of excellent, simple, and kindly people. The old Count's hospitality and good nature, which struck one especially in Petersburg as a pleasant surprise, were such that Prince Andrew could not refuse to stay to dinner. Yes, he thought, they are capital people, who of course have not the slightest idea what a treasure they possess in Natasha, but they are kindly folk, and form the best possible setting for this strikingly poetic, charming girl overflowing with life. In Natasha, Prince Andrew was conscious of a strange world completely alien to him, and brimful of joys unknown to him, a different world, that in the Audrino Avenue and at the window that moonlight night had already begun to disconcert him. Now this world disconcerted him no longer, and was no longer alien to him, but he himself, having entered it, found in it a new enjoyment. As soon as Natasha had finished, she went up to him and asked how he liked her voice. She asked this, and then became confused, feeling that she ought not to have asked it. He smiled, looking at her, and said he liked her singing as he liked everything she did. Prince Andrew left the Rostovs late in the evening. He went to bed from habit, but soon realized that he could not sleep. Having lit his candle, he sat up in bed, then got up, then lay down again, not at all troubled by his sleeplessness. His soul was as fresh and joyful as if he had stepped out of a stuffy room into God's own fresh air. It did not enter his head that he was in love with Natasha. He was not thinking about her, but only picturing her to himself, and in consequence all life appeared in a new light. Why do I strive, why do I toil in this narrow, confined frame, when life, all life with all its joys, is open to me, said he to himself. And for the first time for a very long while he began making happy plans for the future. He decided that he must attend to his son's education by finding a tutor, and putting the boy in his charge. Then he ought to retire from the service and go abroad, and see England, Switzerland, and Italy. I must use my freedom while I feel so much strength and youth in me, he said to himself. Pierre was right when he said one must believe in the possibility of happiness in order to be happy, and now I do believe in it. Let the dead bury their dead, but while one has life, one must live and be happy, thought he. End of chapter 19. Recording by Wet Coast, Vancouver, Canada.